This here, guys, is the all-new BMW 5 Series, codenamed the G60. But more than that, this is also the i5, essentially a full electric version of the next-gen 5 Series. Here in Malaysia, this is the only G60 you can buy just yet, with the petrol versions to come in later. So, the questions are, how is the BMW i5 like to drive on Malaysian roads? And has BMW ruined its traditional 5 Series business sedan by making it full electric? Or does it still have that iconic BMW driving dynamics? Let's find out all that together. Let's begin with the generational leap forward with this G60. This replaces the outgoing G30, which had a design that pretty much everyone liked. That was very easy on the eyes, I would say. This, however, is a big leap forward. It's far sharper, bigger, blockier than before, and it's quite a bit bolder as well. Not everybody is going to love this design straight from the off. This reminds me very much of when BMW changed the iconic E39 5 Series into the far more controversial Chris Bangle designed E60. That 5 Series took a long time for people to get used to, but eventually they did. And if you look at one now, I still think it has that classy, premium, avant-garde look, much more so than its contemporary Mercedes E-Class, the W211. History has basically repeated itself over here with BMW taking a big risky jump with the 5 Series with Mercedes-Benz taking a far safer evolutionary route with the latest W214 E-Class. Between the two, I'd say that the E-Class looks better today right now but a couple years down the road, perhaps this is going to be the one that everyone thinks is the better of the two. Do you agree with me on this? Comment below. Speaking of BMW versus Mercedes, there are big differences in terms of their strategies too. Mercedes-Benz has completely two separate models, the regular E-Class and the full electric EQE. But BMW has effectively merged the two, with the i5 over here being full electric, but it looks exactly the same as the regular ICE-powered 5 Series. So again, in the here and now, the EQE does have a bit of an edge for people who want their EVs to look more unique and more distinctive right now. But BMW is taking a bolder, braver choice by saying electric cars are not the future, it is here and now. So there you go, the i5 and electric 5 Series looks the same as our regular cars. Moving on to prices, there is just a single variant here in Malaysia right now, like I mentioned, the i5 eDrive 40 M Sport. Prices start at just under 400,000 ringgit here in Malaysia, but that is with the basic two year warranty. Add in the five year coverage with a service package, and it goes up to 420,000 ringgit. Petrol versions will come a little bit later, but for now, you can still buy the last gen G30 530i, which is priced just 10,000 ringgit less than this one. This G60 i5 is practically superior in every single way over the G30, so this being just a little bit more expensive makes this fantastic value in my books. It's the same story when you compare this against the Mercedes-Benz EQE as well. Prices are practically the same, 420,000 ringgit, but in the Malaysian market, the EQE has had a few compromises to bring it down to this price level. It rides on very small wheels, there's no big screen inside, and generally, it does feel a little bit compromised. But here on the other hand, with the i5, this is virtually completely maxed out when it comes to specs. Okay, so now let's talk about the looks. Like I said before, this has a bit of a polarizing, controversial design, but thankfully not to the degree of the BMW iX and the latest i7. This still looks rather sleek overall, but compared to the universally loved G30 5 Series, this definitely has a bit more of that love it or hate it look. 
It has a very edgy, semi-futuristic look to it, which I think works quite well. The sculpted bonnet is taken right off the BMW M3 and the M4, and the grille obviously is the biggest we've seen on a 5 Series yet. Thankfully again, it takes a wide shape rather than a tall one like in the iX and the 7 Series, and it also has this big glow around it when the lights are on. That is the optional iconic glow that is standard for Malaysia. One thing I don't like, however, is that the front camera is not placed directly on the center of the grille. It's off to the side a little bit, which is just a little bit weird. Call me OCD, but I'm sure there is a neater way to integrate the camera into the grille over here. The lights, however, I quite like. It has a bit of a step design, and at the bottom, there are a few blue highlights all over. I think it looks really cool. One thing I'm not a big fan of is that the iconic BMW Corona Rings daytime running lights are now reduced to simple vertical strips next to the actual projectors. Certainly look far less distinctive than before. Also standard for the Malaysian market is the full M Sport exterior package. This comes with a far more aggressive bumper up front, deeper side sills all around, and a more elaborate diffuser at the back. What's even more outstanding, however, is the choice of the wheels. These are the top of the line 21 inch BMW individual wheels, the biggest you can get on the i5. Here in Malaysia, we are just so used to getting smaller wheels that this comes at a bit of a surprise. The wheels are so large, in fact, there's hardly any tyres left. You can see the profile is just so thin. It's 35s up front and 30s at the back. Speaking of tyres, these are the latest HL rated tyres from Pirelli's made specifically for electric vehicles. Around the side is where this car gives me the most E60 vibes, especially with the slab sided look of it all. You can just see how thick the car is from the bottom up to the window lines, and BMW knows this very well. They've tried to hide it a little bit by painting the full side skirts completely black. But overall, I still don't think this is the most handsome sedan shape of them all, especially with the rear deck dipping down a little bit at the tail end. In terms of size, the 5 Series has gone over 5 meters for the very first time. This is significantly bigger than the outgoing G30. It's longer by almost 100 millimeters. So as usual, the 5 Series has just grown bigger from generation to generation that it is now actually longer than the E65 7 Series from 20 years ago. New to the G60 is this embossed 5 logo on this so-called Hofmeister kink at the back here, and you can find the same print on the B pillars behind the doors. Speaking of the pillars, you can see that BMW has tried to make all the visible pillars as thin as possible on the outside for a more svelte look. This I quite like. At the back, the new 5 Series has just a simple slim set of taillights which has lost the iconic L shape from previous BMW sedans. The last time BMW did this with the 5 Series was again the E60. To me, it does look a little bit too simple right now, but having said that, I do like this silver strip that runs across the taillights. This being the full electric version, you won't find any exhaust outlets at the bottom, real or fake, and thankfully, the trims at the corners are now just finished in plain black rather than blue or color-coded like in most other BMW i models. But as usual, the emblems do have the blue ring around it like in most other electrified BMW models. Inside, the G65 series is just as much as a revolutionary design shift compared to the G35 series. Now, don't get me wrong, the G30 had a really good interior for its time. It had great design, it had great quality as well, but this new one just takes it up to a whole another level. Plus, crucially, unlike the Mercedes-Benz EQE, there are not that many visible cost-cutting measures on this one, so they've kept the standards of quality really high as well. Now let's talk about the design first. This has this big massive curved display at the front, 12 inches plus for the instrument cluster, nearly 15 inches wide for the center screen, and it's also angled towards the driver very slightly in the traditional BMW 5 Series way. But beyond just the screen, this has plenty of 
other flourishes as well. Number one, you won't find any visible aircon vents on it, which has been for the longest time the main features of most car interiors. For this car, the aircon vents have actually been hidden behind this center piece over here and you adjust them not through the screen thankfully but by using the small little stubs over here now i do wish that the stubs are a little bit bigger and easier to control but i think it does look pretty neat the way it is now at least there are still physical controls for the vents and you know not unlike teslas that require you to go through the screens to adjust where the vent would blow that is over complication to say the least but as it is, this is a really nice way to elevate or to modernize your interior without going too far. This to me looks far more futuristic compared to say even the W214 Mercedes-Benz E-Class interior, let alone the really weird and funky EQE interior. The best part is though, BMW has achieved that without sacrificing real-world user-friendliness. You still get a volume dial over here, you get your traditional BMW iDrive rotary controller. All finished in crystal by the way, looks fantastic and you still have all the shortcut buttons close to you right there. Overall, this is still as easy to use as the previous generation. 5 series. Well, maybe not quite because they have moved all the aircon controls into the screen over here. So while you can adjust the temperature from the main screen over here to adjust the fan specifically, you still have to press the fan icon over there and adjust it up or down. I still think that's a few steps too many for simple things like adjusting the aircon I think. Another thing I don't quite like is that the instrument cluster is hardly customizable at all. I mean, you can move things about and you can choose what the center portion displays, but all in all, you're always stuck with this over-stylized, over-futuristic dials on the sides. I would still prefer a more traditional analog dials, especially from BMW. They used to make the best ones in the industry. But one thing I absolutely love though is the ambient lighting on this car. For the longest time, BMW has trailed well behind Mercedes-Benz when it comes to ambient lighting. But here, they've finally taken a big leap forward and I think for once, they are ahead of BMW in this regard. There's this big massive BMW interaction bar and it changes colors depending on what you do on the screens. For instance, if you press the hazards, the entire dashboard, the entire strip will just light up in red. I think it looks great. And this also ties in with specific features in the car as well. For instance, every time you try to open the door, there is going to be a sensor trying to see if there is going to be an oncoming car or not. If there is the entire sidebar on the door will just pulse red to tell you you don't open the door right now there is a car coming i think that works really well but as flashy as it is i still don't think it's quite customizable enough like in the mercedes-benz you can set multiple colors in the same car like say the top part in blue middle part in green bottom part in pink if you want it it can do so but in the i5 all you can do is pick from a lot of different color options but whatever you choose that's what it's going to display and that's it I also have an issue with the mode selection within this car. You get an option between personal, sport, efficient, expressive, relaxed and digital art. But there isn't a clear explanation what each one of the modes would do. For instance, what exactly is expressive and what is digital art other than, you know, painting your whole dashboard purple or green and yellow. I don't see if it does anything else really. The worst part is, there is a single mode that is actually customizable, which is Sport. This is the only mode that allows you to change drivetrain settings, dynamic settings, steering, damping, and so on. Everything else are presets that you cannot adjust. There is no longer a fully customizable individual settings like before. But okay, before I start sounding like Jeremy Clarkson that just hates everything on every car, let's talk about bits that I like, which is the quality on this car. From the very top, which is soft touch, to the metallic feel of this center trim, the more softer bits down here as well, pretty much everything that you can see on touch on the BMW i5 feels like 
top-notch quality but of course if you look very closely you can start to find a few harder plastics here and there but at no point does it ever feel cheap if you are to look at the mercedes-benz e-class or especially the eqe there are plenty of cheap plastics that are out in the open very easy for you to spot i mean the latest 5 series isn't quite perfect i mean you can certainly find a few bits and pieces that have been downgraded compared to the old version the sun visors especially have been given this really scratchy cheaper plastic instead of being covered in nice fabric like before but beyond that you do feel like this is a high quality cabin certainly better certainly set to a higher standards compared to a mercedes-benz e-class or the eqe now on to the center screen over here it runs the latest bmw os which i'm just not a big fan of this big center part over here is pretty much just showing a random photo which you can't actually change what you can do is just swipe up or down on this right side over here which isn't quite as user friendly as you know a big home screen with tiles like before and as you go into the app drawer i mean come on this still looks like a really old school cheapo samsung phone from 20 years ago that's not a good look at all but then again most people will just use the apple carplay system which is fully wireless of course and the integration over here is almost comically wide it takes up the entire screen and even though it's wireless it works really well there's pretty much no lag whatsoever and the sound going through the system sounds fantastic through this Bowers and Wilkins sound system. This to me is easily one of the best sound systems you can get on any car at any price. It uses 19 speakers over 600 watts. Again, it's not quite as high-end as the G30 Bowers and Wilkins systems. That's well over 1000 watts. So this is a bit of a downgrade, a bit of a cost optimizations over there but I still think it sounds way better than the previous Harman Kardon systems. For now this is the top of the line audio system that's available on the i5 and yeah it does give you the feeling that we are getting the absolute top spec version the best version of the i5 here in Malaysia. At this price I think it's excellent. Now onto the back, as you can see, I've got plenty of legroom back here. The extra size of the 5 Series, like I mentioned before, it's now bigger than a few 7 Series from before. It certainly translates to a much bigger cabin in the back here as well. Legroom is good. Headroom is also very, very good. For your reference, I am 167 centimeters tall, but I'm sure if you're much, much bigger, you should be able to fit in the back here very comfortably as well. But it's not quite perfect back here though. The floor is relatively high to fit in the big battery pack underneath. So if you are sitting up straight, your knees are slightly up in the air. And especially if you've got long legs, that's not going to be particularly comfortable for you in long journeys. And then you've got the rear bench itself, which is rather scalloped. You're sitting in somewhat of a V because the base is angled a little bit too high up. I'm sure this has to do with the raised floor as well to give you that extra sense of space. But this takes a little bit of getting used to, I suppose. But having said that, I've got nothing against the rear angle of the seat. I think it's really good. And headroom is also commendably good as well. This car has a rather unique roller shutter for the panoramic sunroof because it rolls forward instead of backwards like in most other cars. They've done this to free up more space in the back here. So even if you're particularly tall, you won't have any issues with headroom in the back here. That is a really good design. Other than that, you've got plenty of aircon vents in the back here. Two in the middle as usual and two more on the B pillars. Plus, you've also got a full proper four zone climate control system in this car. You can set different temperatures left and right and you can adjust the blower settings as well through this touchpad controls in the middle here. I think that looks pretty good. Even the build quality holds up really well in the back here. The tops of the door cards are still nice and soft. The seats are all proper leather. No, you know, vegan leather option like in most other buckets. We get the real stuff over here. Really soft, really nice to sit in. 
Other than that, you've got the usual side window blinds which are still manual. This is two-piece by the way to cover even the side quarter window as well. What I don't like however, there are a few things that actually feel rather cheap in the back here. Number one is this thing. I've complained about this thing on various BMWs including the flagship 1.4 million ringgit XM but yeah, this is still the same cheaper plastic thing that we've seen on too many BMW models. And then there's the door pockets on the side as well. It looks pretty good but the insides are actually not lined in anything, it's just plain plastic. Yeah, and it sounds cheap if you knock on them. And one last complaint, even though this is a full electric vehicle, there is still this big center hump because of course this is a shared model between the regular 5 series and this all electric i5. And one last thing before we move on, curiously there are no rear seat pockets on this car at all. That's just weird man. As for the boot, it is decently sized at 490 litres and that also includes a sizable underfloor storage for all your charging cables. But there is still a slight price to pay for going full electric as the regular petrol 5 series has 520 litres of boot space instead. All right, we're finally driving the new BMW i5 and I'll tell you right now what an experience it is. As usual, let's start with all the numbers first. This is the eDrive 4T variant, the only one available in Malaysia right now. And this has a single electric motor powering the rear wheel. So yes, this is a rear wheel drive BMW, not in the most traditional sense, but yeah. Well, it's still rear wheel drive all the same. This here is rated at 313 PS and 400 Newton meters of torque. So if you compare that against a regular ice powered petrol BMW 5 series, that's about equivalent to say a BMW 530i or maybe a 535i, something like that. But there is also a boost mode that can, well, boost the numbers up to 340 PS and 440 newton meters of torque. You do that by just pulling the single pedal on the left over here and the car just shoots forward. Shoots forward like a much quicker car than a BMW 530i or even a 540i ever will. 0 to 100 is claimed to be done in just 6 seconds flat. That may not sound like an amazingly fast car. In fact, it's actually slower than the G30 530i. That does it in 5.9 seconds but I'll tell you what, that is just on paper. From the seat of my pants, this feels far quicker than the 530i ever did. But having said that, this is still a single motor two-wheel drive EV and not a dual motor all-wheel drive performance machine like quite a few of its other competitors are. So its acceleration is fast by ICE car, by petrol car standards, but not by electric car standards. Most electric cars now with all-wheel drive can do the 0 to 100 sprint in about 5 seconds, some of them even 4 seconds and below. So by those new standards, this is considered okay, not incredibly quick. But like I said, if you're coming into this car from say a 520i, 530i, E300, even E400, this will feel quicker. I especially like the fact that you can trigger the boost mode by just pulling this lever on the left side over here and off you go. You don't have to go through menus or press special buttons to go into a sport mode. Just pull a paddle and off you go. That is fantastic. That is far more intuitive than most other systems out there. Especially with EVs, I usually like to drive in the most efficient driving mode. There is like eco or efficient and so on. With this car, I can do exactly that and still get the full power by just pulling a single paddle. Yeah, I absolutely love this setup right here. But again, as with most EVs, its acceleration is properly explosive only at lower speeds. As you go higher, say 100 kilometers per hour, doing the same, 
it still gives you that kick but it's not quite as electric as you know properly true blue high performance cars but overall man what a powertrain this is this is easily one of the most refined one of the easiest to drive electric vehicles i've tested so far and i've driven practically all of them really this is an EV that doesn't require you to adapt to a whole different driving style. It doesn't make you take compromises just to drive an EV efficiently. It just drives like a normal ICE car without the noise, sure, but yeah, the power is there, the feel is there, that emotional connection, it is all still there. And then when it comes to handling, this still drives like a true blue BMW. That iconic BMW DNA is still here. If anything, if you're still one of those people who think all electric cars are boring, if you still think you're gonna steer clear of all EVs until they make the very last petrol vehicle, this is the car that you really need to drive today. Trust me, believe me, you will be converted. You will then believe that EV is the future right now. Now let's talk about the efficiency or rather the lack of it for this car. I've driven this car for about 300, almost 400 kilometers on my regular daily routine and I've averaged between 16 to 17 kilowatt hours per 100 kilometers against this car's full battery capacity of 83.9 kilowatt hours. That works out to a full effective range of around 500 kilometers, just slightly more that is well below the claim range of 584 and i'm sure that has mostly to do with the big massive wheels on the side as you know bigger wheels are usually heavier and especially when it comes to evs those are the biggest things that will cut down on your range so as it is i'd say this car has an effective range of around 500 kilometers and with the battery being an nmc pack and not an lfp most of the time you should only charge it to about 80 85 percent you cut that down even further by taking into consideration the true real world effective range of between 20 to 80 percent soc and that brings it down to just about 300 kilometers of real world effective range whether that's enough for you or not that's for you to decide but I think my personal opinion if you have access to a home charger that should be more than enough for you 300 or up to 500 at a stretch that should be more than enough for you to use the car without having any range anxiety at all plus for those emergency long distance journeys or meetings I would safely assume that customers of cars at this price range would have a second car that they can rely on. So that's not a problem at all. Looking at the numbers alone, the claim range of 584 kilometers, that would require the car to average less than 15 kilowatt hours per 100 kilometers. I can safely say that is categorically impossible possible on Malaysian roads unless you do extreme hyper miling so yeah when you buy the car you can pretty much ignore the claim range of the BMW i5 just keep in mind 500 kilometers or less you should be safe right there now on to charging, I would say the i5 is just about average. For home charging, AC charging, this takes up to 11 kilowatts, which is about par for the course for a car like this, even though more and more EVs are starting to offer 22 kilowatt onboard chargers here in the Malaysian market. For now, 11 seems okay, but I think 22 just makes it so much easier for everyone to accept an EV, I think. As for DC, this has a rather respectable 205 kilowatt maximum charge rate, which is about okay. Nowhere near as fast as say those 800 volt architecture EVs like the Ionic 5, the Kia EV6, Porsche Taycan, the Audi e-tron GT and so on. But having said that, BMW claims they've worked really hard on this car's charge 
charging curve to make it very close to 800 volt electric vehicles. This car still runs 400 volts of course, but to charge in terms of high power DC, it gets really close to proper 800 volt car experience. On paper, you can charge the i5 from 10 to 80% SOC in just over 30 minutes. But effectively, if you're charging it from say 30, 40, 50, 60% SOC, the car will jump up to its maximum rate of 205 for a short time before slowly, gradually going down. That is far better than those big steps that most other 400 volt EVs will take as you charge it up. Again, not quite as good as proper 800 volt EVs or even Tesla's special, you know, high ampere charging capabilities, but it is still better than most regular EVs out there. Now let's move on to handling, which I've just touched upon briefly just now. This really does still drive like a true blue BMW. It may be overly bloated, it weighs over two tons, whereas the regular 5 Series from before is around 1.7 tons or so. So yes, there is a big weight penalty because of the large battery pack under the car. But to drive, you'd hardly ever notice it. This has the agile feel of a regular 5 Series, which is to say far superior than everything else within the same class. This feels far more dynamic than say the equivalent Mercedes-Benz E-Class. It feels far more lively to throw into corners, just take it by the scruff of its neck and it will sing with you. It is a beautiful car to drive. The steering especially is really, really good in terms of not quite feedback, but just about giving you enough feel to throw it down the corners and enjoy it. And it works really well with the powertrain as well. There isn't a gearbox per se, there is just a single speed over here. But coming out of corners, shooting out of corners, this has a really gradual acceleration that you feel one with the car. This is easily one of the most enjoyable, one of the best electric vehicles I've ever tested. Again, if you still think all electric cars are boring, just take a quick drive with this one. Five minutes will have you fully convinced this is the way forward. What is less convincing, however, is BMW's iconic sounds option. This, as you know, is composed by Hans Zimmer, but just have a listen. Yeah, I don't know what that is, but that is not what I think excitement sounds like. There's also a few different sounds that you can choose from. That is in sport mode, but if you drive it in expressive mode, whatever that means, it sounds like this instead. Yeah, that sounds like the beginning of that, you know, THX sound thing. Yeah, not a fan. Thankfully, you can turn it off, so it just sounds absolutely serene, quiet as you drive along. So yeah, this is more like it. Now let's move on to ride comfort, which for a big sedan like this is just as important, if anything, even more important than the way this car handles. And here, again, I'll give the BMW i5 absolute top marks. It is absolutely amazing how this car can handle so well and yet ride this good as well. It almost feels like magic and that's even before you consider the big massive 21 inch wheels that it's riding on. You can see that there's hardly any tire sidewall at all so there's hardly any cushioning given by the rubber. And yet this is still one of the best riding cars in the class. This does have an adaptive suspension but that doesn't necessarily ensure that it has great ride and handling. I mean just looking at the cheaper cousin of this car, the BMW iX1, that has a similar adaptive setup as well but it's just way too stiff in my opinion. And then you've also got the BMW iX which is a big hunking machine about the same price as this one as well that rides on standard passive springs and its ride 
is a little bit too stiff as well. BMW has absolutely nailed it with the i5 over here. I think it's right and handling package is absolutely remarkable. It's almost magic what this car is giving you right now. If there is a fault at low speeds, you do still feel the sharp bumps and sharp jolts in the car a little bit more so than in the previous G35 series. But you also need to remember that those versions had smaller wheels and thicker tires as well. I'm very sure that had BMW put on more sensible tire wheel combination on this G60, it will just have superior ride and handling across the board. Next, let's talk about refinement and as you can tell by now, you've been listening to me going on and on, going, raving about this car for quite a while now and you've hardly hear any wind noise coming into the cabin at all. There is a tiny bit of road noise, tyre noise coming in. Again, that's because this car runs on such silly tyre combination, very thin, very wide. I'm sure if it rides on narrower, thicker tyres, there'll be a lot less road noise coming in. But even then, going at 80, 90 kilometers per hour, this is very much respectable for a business sedan like so. Even in terms of wind noise, there's hardly anything coming in. If you go faster and faster at, at about 120, 130, there is a little bit of whistling coming through the A pillars over here because surprisingly, this does not come with double glazed windows. You got regular windows on the side, so there is a bit of a disappointment right there. But by and large, this is a very composed, very comfortable car in its own right. It can be better still, of course, but if you keep your expectations in check, I think this should be more than good enough for you. And last but not least, the full ADAS systems, the Active Safety Assist systems. As you know, this has been one of my bugbears with BMW Malaysia cars. Most of its cars do not have ADAS or Active Safety Systems as standard. Pretty much you have to buy the top of the line models to even have a sniff at having a few ADAS features. But with the i5, they've just put in every single feature they can. It practically drives by itself, like so. Even in Putrajaya, where you know the roads are a little bit bumpy, sometimes the road lines just completely disappear or very, very faint, this car can handle it all. It even takes corners rather well as well. As you can see, we are coming up to a bit of a bend and the car can take that corner, no issues at all. This is easily one of the better semi-autonomous driving systems out there. It is super smooth, it is very careful as well, and there is a display where you can see what the car is sensing, what the car is seeing in front and around it. It is really convincing and I think it feels pretty safe as well. Another feature that this car has over most other vehicles with semi-autonomous driving features is full lane change assist. So with adaptive cruise control on, I can just indicate right or left and the car will sense around it to see that there's any car around you and if it's safe to do so, it will do the automatic lane change all by itself. This is really cool. Now, left and it's going to look around. If it's safe, it's going to do it for you. Now, I don't think this is a feature that you will completely rely on, that you will use a lot, but it's still a nice feature to have to show off to your friends. Your car can actually do that and do it safely. I still think that is pretty cool. So there you go. That's my full review of the all new G60 BMW i5 here in Malaysia. All in all, this is nothing short of a fabulous car from BMW. Yes, its looks may be a little bit questionable for now and its range may fall well short of the claimed figure, especially with the big wheels. But beyond those two faults, I'd say this car is above average, excellent even. Being full electric, this may be far removed from the traditional BMW cars that most driving enthusiasts like. But 
all they have to do is stick one drive and I'm sure they will be full converts. This car still drives like a true blue BMW. That DNA is still there and it's smooth, it's quiet, it's comfortable, it's a very capable handler and the ride especially is surprising that it's so good despite having those big 21 inch wheels. Overall, this has that level of fluidity and completeness that only BMW can deliver. BMW, take a bow. With the i5, you've absolutely smashed it out of the park. And for Mercedes-Benz, you've really got your work cut out with this one. For now, what do you think of my review and the car itself? Let me know in the comment section below. For now, thank you for watching and stay safe everyone.